This is a sword. This is a paddle. Any questions? Well, I've put zero effort into this cardboard prop. Why would I? It's fantasy, so it doesn't have to be well designed. I'll just claim it's enchanted. Generic placeholder magic will explain everything. Seriously though, I like fantasy and magic. However, I also appreciate when there is some more thought put into it and authors or designers come up with more nuanced specific magical effects than just a lazy, this would be impossible to use, you say, well, but it's magic, her <laughs> her. Just to clarify, yes, I know, it's just video games, movies, whatever, and they don't need to be logical. And sometimes being ludicrously over the top and bizarre is exactly what makes them fun. But deliberately overanalyzing something that was not meant to be practical can be fun too. So here we go. What would happen if you tried to make and use fantasy weapons in real life? In some cases it would work reasonably well, or at least it wouldn't be a total disaster. But the total disasters are what interests us, right? So I googled ridiculous sword. Was not disappointed. Yep, that's a classic. Ugh, those are horrible. What the hell is this? Oh, never mind. Here are some of the recurring themes. Issues with the design that would make it either impossible to use in a real fight or at least extremely disadvantageous. For one, they're often way too large and sometimes have a tiny handle which couldn't even support all of that mass under the stress of a forceful impact without exploding into a thousand splinters. The thing is, in an actual fight, you can't just slowly lift your giant spiky metal monstrosity of spinal deformity and drop it on your opponent's head, because by the time it falls they simply won't be there anymore. So in order to be effective against any opponent other than an arthritic 90 year old with asthma, you need to move really fast. And as I've explained in a previous video, accelerating a tremendously heavy and bulky object to velocities that would be effective in combat would literally pull you off your feet, unless your body is either supernaturally heavy or you can somehow anchor your feet to the ground. Hopefully without having your tendons and ligaments torn off by all of that momentum tugging at you. So you may ask, but couldn't it be made of special super light fantasy metals or be imbued with weight altering magic or couldn't the planet's gravity be lower? Well, if the gravity is lower than it is on Earth, that most likely means that the planet's inhabitants are weaker than we are because their anatomy is adapted to the local conditions. Plus, their body would also be less affected by gravity, so we're back at being dragged around by your own weapon. And if the laws of physics are so different, how can they even fight in ways we expect anyway? Regardless, there is a problem with super light but grotesquely large weapons. What? is the point. You're not gaining anything from it. In fact, quite the opposite. It makes the weapon far more awkward to maneuver, it's useless in confined spaces, and it even obstructs your vision depending on just how large it is. The only thing that it achieves is more reach, but you can have that with a reasonably sized polearm, for example. There is another problem with how thick fantasy swords often are. A massive cross-section not only adds unnecessary weight, it's also laughably bad at cutting. You know, cutting what a sword is supposed to do, unlike a club. Here are two different blade cross sections. Guess which one has less resistance as it passes through a target and thereby cuts better. Yep, you got it. This is more of a bludgeon. Not that blunt weapons are not effective, they are. But why make a sword in such a way that you negate the main advantages that the sword has over an impact weapon? Swords are much more nimble not as tiring to use, allow more technical finesse, and can disable unarmored opponents with cuts and thrusts to soft tissue, which is much more difficult to do with a blunt metal bar. Speaking of the handling characteristics of a sword, generally it has more mass in the hilt than in the blade, and the resulting balance is what makes it comparatively effortless to move quickly. But of course you can overdo everything. If you slap a bunch of unnecessary extra parts on the guard and make it extra thick, you can give it the balance of an upside down hammer. Go ahead, grab a hammer or an axe like this and try to strike hard with it. It just doesn't have enough mass in the handle, i.e. the blade, to generate much force. At the same time, your opponent can use leverage against you more easily if the blade is that light compared to the hilt. In case of a dedicated thrusting weapon like a rapier, that's not a problem. but 
Something like this is clearly intended for cutting and that just wouldn't work very well. In short, an extremely bulky guard doesn't do much aside from adding weight where it doesn't benefit you, but rather does the opposite. Large guards are good if they actually serve to protect the hand and are not thicker and thereby heavier than needed. And then there is this. If I tried to point out everything that's wrong with it, I'd be here all day. Instead, how about a fun experiment? Take a sword or a stick, tape a knife or dagger or whatever similar pointy object you have to it so that the pokey bit is facing you. Then figure out how safe it would be to swing that thing around. The same applies to a wide variety of spikes, gigantic serrations and arbitrary geometric shapes plastered all over vaguely sword-like objects. If it has one or more sharp points or corners that are aimed at the user, it's probably not the most brilliant idea. But even the ones that are facing the opponent can be problematic. Have you ever tried cutting a piece of rubber or foam with a coarse tooth saw? It may look impressive and nasty. But a plain edge may actually slice deeper. Also, simple cloth can actually be quite a problem. If you have large protruding hooks and spikes on the blade, you're actually limiting the damage it could do. Imagine one blade with a smooth, acutely tapered edge that slices deeply into flesh and severs bone. I know, graphic. Now imagine a blade with a weird point that pokes into the flesh and then gets stuck on bone. Even worse, it can potentially get stuck before it even gets past the clothing, which can bunch up and lodge itself between the points of serrations. But what's worse than a jagged blade? A jagged handle. If you want to make sure that the user can't even hold a sword properly, let alone strike something without needing reconstructive hand surgery afterwards, shape the handle like this. Or similarly. And it's not just about comfort. If the handle has bumps and corners and tumors all over the place, you won't be able to close your hand fully around it. There will be gaps and your fingers will be inconsistently placed, some flexed more strongly than others. This leads to a weak grip and your opponent could more easily disarm you or make the handle vibrate painfully in your hand. And finally, we have glaring structural weaknesses. Even assuming super strong materials, something like this is just begging to snap at the first hard knock. All this bulk attached to a few thin pieces right in the area where most of the force is absorbed when the handle is crashing against a hard object. If you take a broom handle, cut off the bottom third, and then reattach the pieces by gluing a few matchsticks in between them, how well do you think that's going to work when you smash it over your obnoxious neighbor's head? Don't do that, by the way. There are other issues like glass blades and other unsuitable materials, for instance, but these are the most common reasons why fantasy designs wouldn't work in real life that I've seen. In any case, I hope you found this entertaining and informative. That was kind of the idea. Thanks for watching. Skull smash!